Um, okay, got that message. <laughs> okay, Martin is the youngest member of the Gregas Creatives Group. Uh, he was born into a family of artists in Slovakia. They're all very creative. He's come by his uh, art, art, artistic traits very honestly. <laughs> uh, he's an international award-winning photographer, cinematographer, and guide. Uh, his article on living amongst polar bears, and he did a presentation on that for us in 2021, um, has appeared in National Geographic, uh, Canadian Geographic, Geo France, as well as a number of other prestigious magazines. So his photos and his article really made a hit around the world, which is wonderful. And in 2021, um, in part because of that, those photos, he won the Rising Star Portfolio Award in the Wildlife Photographer of the Year contest. So that's a pretty big deal. Uh, tonight, Martin is going to take us from the Arctic to the South Pole, travels that he did in 2023. Uh, during his journey, he photographed wildlife above and below the water and noted new behavior and the everyday struggles of animals who are living in some of the most drastically changing environments on the planet. And I noticed that one of the photos that he gave us ahead of time was called Sea Ice, but there wasn't very much. <laughs> which I guess is one of the big problems, and certainly for the polar bears. So I'm going to turn it over to Martin, who I'm sure will regale us with a wonderful presentation. Thanks, Martin. Thanks, Lola. Thank you. It's uh, <clears throat> happy to uh, be here again to a very familiar, familiar crowd, and I hope um, this presentation will also show some um, new pictures, even though I... Um, this year was interesting because I spent eight months now um, on the road. I returned on the 15th of December um, from Antarctica. And before that, I was in, in the Arctic, um, mostly working for um, for a show I will get to um, shortly. Um, but a lot of the year has actually been under NDA. So I unfortunately can't even talk about it until 2026. Um, so there will be some things that are going to be a slight repeat, but I, um, I did prepare a whole bunch of, um, new clips and videos, but, um, let me just start sharing my screen here. Um, oh, um, Elizabeth, um, I have to be, um, it says host disabled for sharing screens. So if you make me a, um, so I can share my screen or Jim, sorry about that. Yeah, just so I can share my, um, PDF, let me know when it's ready, but yeah, so I, um, got back, like I said, in, in December from Antarctica where um, I worked with um, my dad aboard um, the National Geographic um, Explorer, uh, taking some pictures of um, the wildlife from basically Falklands to South Georgia and all the way to Antarctica, which was um, quite an amazing trip. And here we go. We are ready to go. Okay. There we are. Everyone seeing this okay? Full screen? Is that okay? Okay. Um, yeah, so this is um, a picture that's um, probably familiar from my past presentations. It was um, a picture of me and my dad. And actually this year, I um, spent quite a big chunk of my year not with uh, my family at all. I left in um, March. I went to Mexico. And then in May, I left for the Arctic and I didn't come back from the Arctic until September when I immediately got on a plane and went to Tahiti because I missed my entire summer in Vancouver. Um, so I decided to take a shoot in the South Pacific. And then immediately after that, uh, my dad and I went to um, Antarctica to go film there, which was quite the treat because I spent the whole year um, filming animals from uh, from the air using drones and things like that. Um, but the trip to Antarctica with Lindblad was specifically designated for 
uh, photography. Uh, and they specifically said, we don't want you filming. We don't want you droning. Just go have some fun and take pictures, which was quite an amazing experience to kind of take pick up the camera again. Because over uh, the years and over the year, doing filming for natural history with drones and things like that, I kind of lost um, lost touch with, with photography. Um, but then in uh, in Antarctica, I was finally able to to pick up the camera and and take pictures. Um, I'm not sure who here has been to Antarctica, Jim. I know you um, a few years ago went down, um, but it is an absolutely uh, amazing place, uh, full of full of life, and it's one of those places that in the past has been described to me as one of the one place where you go and feel like you shouldn't be there. Uh, and that could not be um, more true where you have um, icebergs, you know, the size of um, small countries. Um, one, in fact, uh, this was a chunk of it, um, was one that broke off in 1983 and has been sort of floating in the Weddell Sea um, until this year when it finally broke off from Antarctica and is now making its way towards South Georgia and the South Atlantic, uh, where within now a few few months, maybe a year, it will break up into chunks kind of like this one um, and disappear completely. Um, now on the, the channel itself, um, it is quite um, an amazing, um, amazing place with, um, just mountains and icebergs and penguins sort of um, wandering amongst the mix. So for this picture, one of my personal favorites from the Lemire Channel uh, on the Antarctic Peninsula, um, we were sailing down. Um, what it, It's interesting because it, this is actually, it looks like a, a fjord, um, but on the right-hand side, it's actually, um, actually an island. Uh, and, Kind of in between here on the other side, you have um, various penguin colonies, a daily chin strap. Um, Martin, I'm not seeing it, I'm sorry. Martin, you're not showing the right film of pictures, I think. Oh, am I not? No, I don't think so. What is sharing right now? Uh, just a picture of you and you willing on the ice. Oh, I, oh, hold on, let me, sorry about that. How about now? Oh, uh, this is your your ice field. That's good. You see an iceberg? Iceberg, yeah. yeah. Ah, okay, perfect. That's okay, good. let me go back through the pictures then, because you just missed a big. <laughs> um, I was just showing them to myself, and uh, I know all of them. <laughs> um, so this was our um crossing across the the Drake Passage, um, which is sort of where the journey to Antarctica, um, begins. Um, and then this was the the ice shelf that I was talking about uh, earlier, or a piece of it that that has broken off. Um, it was actually quite amazing when we approached the ice shelf. There was um, a group of um, chinstrap penguins, and for, to us, they they were just sitting on top of this iceberg. Um, and then once we got closer, we actually saw a pot of uh, pot of orcas uh, that were actually trying to. Um, trying to hunt the penguins, which was quite, quite amazing to see. Um, and then once we finally got to, got to the peninsula, this was the, the site I was talking about the Lemire channel with, um, on the right hand side, um, being an Island and then the mainland and mainland of the continent being on the, on the left. And I just find it amazing how, um, in Antarctica, when people imagine Arctic and Antarctic, they always think kind of flat um ice covered um plains with very little life but once you sort of really um go there and dig into it there's so much life and so much amazing opportunities for photography and scenics and things like that um like this being quite literally 30 minutes away from the previous picture uh just another side of those mountains but looking um completely different uh, now, these pictures were taken um, a little later in the season. This was um, April. So when we were there just now in December, uh, it was still covered in snow. But in April, all the penguins um, already leave, except for a few colonies that sort of stay and actually um, nest um, in Antarctica over winter when all the predators leave. 
um, and just some more pictures of the um, amazing, amazing icebergs. And one thing which is really interesting, and I hear this over and over again when when people talk about Antarctica, is, is they come for the wildlife and they return for the for the ice, which couldn't be more true because when you look at the icebergs, you really see sort of the uh, difference and the tremendous sort of detail in the blues and the shades of colors in an environment that would otherwise be sort of um, brown and white. Uh, and you really start to see the the details in, um, in all of the other in the landscape where one morning we actually woke up and it was, it looked like a black and white picture where you have sort of the the black granite walls and then the uh, fresh snow on the mountains and the black and white penguins, everything sort of seemed to be um, moving in black and white, which was quite spectacular. Um, and then another um, part of um, the wildlife in Antarctica is of course the, the marine life aside from the, the whales, um, it's the seals. Um, this year, unfortunately, Antarctica, um, has been really hard hit um, by the bird flu, um, which is slowly spread from um, south, or sorry, which is spreading from uh, Chile and Argentina, where we were filming um, orcas, and there were colonies of um, elephant seals that have just been wiped out completely, um, or not the this year's ca calves. Um, have been wiped out completely. Um, the male or the big bulls tend to actually be fending off fairly well, um, but it's unfortunate to see the devastating effects uh, the bird flu has had actually on the marine ecosystem aside from the, the birds. The penguins are holding up, but the bird flu is now spreading through the Falklands um, and is having the most impact on South Georgia. So the fear is that uh, it will actually spread from South Georgia into Antarctica um, in the next year, uh, which will, the effects of that will be, uh, are unknown at the moment. In South Georgia, a lot of the landing sites um, with most of the penguins have shut down um, to sort of minimize the, the impact of, of people on the colonies and the spread. Um, but um, it's unknown exactly how much of an effect it will have on the penguin colonies. Hopefully, the idea is that over winter, like um, in this picture, the penguins leave and the um, frigid temperatures will naturally um, make the, the bird flu disappear on the islands, but um, it is still um, quite, uh, quite unknown how that will happen. Um, but... For now, a lot of the animals are still um, doing all right. The The flu is actually impacting a lot of the younger individuals, even in the marine ecosystem in terms of the seals. Uh, the pinnipeds are actually doing, uh, the adult pinnipeds are doing okay. So hopefully it, it will just have a very minimal impact. And actually in South Georgia, uh, the fur seals um, are now double what they were pre uh, whaling um, um, pre whaling times. So the numbers are around three point five million before pre whaling. They just numbered over one million. So um, the bird flu, as much as it could be disastrous, it might put a slight balance onto uh, a right now kind of destabilized ecosystem where uh, the first seals have really sort of. Uh, take in charge of the beaches and when you can walk along the beach like that picture I showed earlier they really are territorial not just to people of course but uh, to the penguins that are trying to get uh, get to shore to reach their nests and their chicks um, these are the uh, these right here uh, you can maybe see them just at the bottom of the picture um, are a uh, 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 daily penguins um, going through that uh, Lemire Channel picture I showed earlier. And the colony is actually just on the other end. So these penguins continuously uh, travel up and down uh, this channel. On occasions are visited by some hungry orcas, uh, which we'll get to shortly. <laughs> um, but uh, another beautiful part, of course, of 
Antarctica and the peninsula is the whales, um, which is um, something I wasn't personally expecting to see so much of, uh, especially considering how um, uh, whaling has sort of decimated the population of whales um, in the South, uh, South Atlantic and along the peninsula. But the humpbacks, um, as I'm sure a lot of you have heard, that they're sort of bouncing back and are almost um, at pre-whaling um, levels. Antarctica, you you really, really see it where um, the whales are quite literally um, everywhere. And the only way I could really describe it is uh, if you imagine the Rocky Mountains uh, with an ocean and just the cars are replaced with whales, um, that's probably the the closest comparison um, you can get where every day you see quite a few humpback whales. And I've been fortunate enough this year um, to follow the humpbacks from the breeding grounds in Mexico, all, or sorry, the cabin grounds in Mexico, all the way to Antarctica, and then back to the South Pacific uh, to their um, uh, cabin grounds there. So it's been quite an amazing journey and I'll get to more of those pictures um, a bit later in the presentation. Um, but yeah, this is a, another picture from Antarctica. Uh, some of you remember from my previous presentations, I specialize in, in flying drones and drone photography. Um, and this was one of those um, moments that I've been dreaming of for a very long time. It was to fly a drone in, in Antarctica. And we finally managed to get our permits and everything fell into place. And then just and one of the bays um, close to a very important marine protected area, we were able to monitor the movements of this glacier, uh, which is actually um, advancing. And the very interesting part about the glaciers in Antarctica right now is that um, the majority of them are actually advancing. And it is this moment uh, between um, the melts where Antarctica is actually now great, getting much greater accumulations of snow than it used to. Um, so a lot of the glaciers are um, gaining mass and, ex um, and expanding, uh, which is very interesting considering sort of the state of the glaciers in the rest of the world. Um, but it is unfortunately sort of just a momentary stage uh, before the snow turns into rain and obviously the glaciers start uh, receding. So it is a natural process. Um, but for the time being, uh, it's quite beautiful to see some of the time lapses. Uh, if you're interested, I'll put a name into um, the chat here. Um, Eric Guth, who works as uh, one of the guides and explorers aboard Lindblad's National Geographic ships. Uh, he studies these glaciers. And if you Google some of his work, you can see um, a lot of the satellite imagery showing the, the glaciers moving down uh, down into these bays. So it's quite quite amazing to see. Um, and again, this is some of the amazing scenery um, you get. And it's actually quite rare to see kind of a bluebird day in Antarctica, just based on the evaporation you get from from the ocean and uh, and the cold air on the on the ice caps. This is kind of a very common sight. The the low hanging clouds covering those beautiful um, mountain peaks we saw earlier. But nonetheless, it's still um, in terms of photography, of course, clouds are always better than just clear blue sky. So um, it was always uh, great to see. Um, and then <clears throat> going back to the the picture I had earlier of the uh, penguins with uh, going up Lemire Channel, uh, I said the orcas chase them around. So this is uh, a pot of specific um, dolphin, dol uh, penguin hunting orcas um, type B. Uh, hunting penguins on the peninsula. And it's worthy noting that this year actually has seen quite an increase in orca activity um, along the Antarctic Peninsula, which um, is um, is actually a good sign for, for the ecosystem. It just means all of the, the wildlife is sort of um, coming back and regaining ground. Um, now, these are specific orcas that hunt penguins. This is, an, uh, I believe, in a daily or a chinstrap penguin. It's hard to say from the bottom angle <laughs> um, that these orcas are, are hunting, but they specialize in, in hunting penguins, or else a different pod specializes in hunting um, the seals, which I'm sure a lot of you have seen in the images at this year's Wildlife Photographer of the Year. 
um, and National Geographic have filmed some spectacular footage of uh, orcas hunting hunting seals in on the peninsula. Um, and this is our our ship um, digging through the the fresh ice that's um, that's just being formed, as well as the calving off of the glaciers, um, and then finally sailing back across the Drake Passage um, into Antarctica. Uh, now, like I mentioned earlier, or sorry, uh, into uh, Argentina. Now, I mentioned earlier that this year, or sorry, this trip was sort of the first time this year, actually, that I've been really focused on on photography because this whole year was encompassed in, in filming. Um, but I will just sort of go back um, since we are um, based in Vancouver and a lot of people, I'm assuming, can't travel to Antarctica because of the various reasons of the remoteness of the area. Uh, it's important to sort of keep a, um, an eye on the wildlife uh, that is local to us. And now some of these pictures might seem familiar because I do use um, these pictures as an introduction to sort of who I am and where I started photography, which was 20 years ago um, from my dad. And this was sort of some of the first pictures I took um, around Vancouver. Uh, this was one of the pictures that got awarded um, in London, my very first in 2008. Uh, and then a picture of the Sandhill Cranes at Rifle Bird Sanctuary um, in 2010. Now this year um, is sort of one of the first years um, in a long time that I might actually be home for a little while. So I'm excited to um, get back to photographing some of the local um, bird species. And I don't know if um, a lot of you uh, were there when um, there was the snowy owl uh, eruption in uh, 2012, I believe, um, at Boundary Bay. Uh, but we had that amazing year when there was just snowy owls um, quite literally everywhere for a few months. Uh, and some of the amazing pictures um, I was able to capture um, over the years. It was two years. It was the, the main year when there was... Um, I, don't know that, the exact numbers, but in this picture, there's eight. There were 20 um, um, earlier in the morning, um, but they stayed for about two years. Um, of course, going back up to the Canadian Arctic um, to lay their eggs and have their chicks. Um, but as soon as um, winter hit uh, for two years in a row, we were greeted with their presence. I don't believe there were any this year. I know there was one last year, um, but it has quite... Uh, become quite the sensation, as I'm sure uh, you know, because it's right in your neighborhood. Whenever they do come in, it's it's uh, it gets pretty crazy down there. So um, I try to take pictures of them while they're still still up north. Um, and then, of course, um, the eagles um, that um, uh, come down um, every year. It was quite amazing, actually. I was just at. Um, uh, at Sasquatch Mountain um, for the holidays, and uh, we were just coming down today, and I haven't actually been to to Harrison Mills and uh, the area around there to film the eagles in quite some time. But uh, the numbers there still have been quite uh, quite excessive, where they're still feeding on uh, leftover salmon um, right at the riverbank, which is quite um, quite good considering we've had very few salmon uh, for the past few years. Um, but yeah, sort of focusing again on the, on the local wildlife with the great gray owls, one of my personal favorite images here. And then um, going back to the marine life, we're actually just looking at sort of expanding our operations into the Great Bear Rainforest um, and sort of focusing it on um, some of the sea otters, which is actually uh, an amazing success story. This picture was actually taken a few years ago. When this was the first sea otter to visit the Broughtons, the archipelago just uh, between uh, northern Vancouver Island and mainland BC. Um, so when we were there in 2015, this was actually the first sea otter that sort of made its way all the way down um, towards Campbell River. And now when I was there in May this year, uh, there was actually rafts of sea otters um all around the Broughtons, uh, feeding on the the massive sea urchin barrens and sort of helping with the recovery of the kelp um so it's a huge success story i i believe for british columbia where the reintroduction of the sea otters is really helping sort of mitigate the effects of climate change and um, shore erosion and things like that 
and they're really making a comeback. So hopefully, maybe within a few years, we'll actually start getting them um, here around um, around southern Vancouver Island and potentially along the Sunshine Coast. Um, of course, helping uh, spectacles like this with, uh, again, uh, the amazing humpback whales. And it's quite extraordinary seeing um, the behavior, this behavior of the bubble net feeding uh, in British Columbia and then seeing it again uh, in Antarctica and then, of course, seeing in them in their um, calving grounds in the South Pacific, where it's actually the bubble net feeding that we witness here in British Columbia. It's actually one of the first places in the world uh, where bubble net feeding was observed a few years ago, um, maybe almost 15, 20 years ago now. Um, it was actually first observed in Alaska, and it really spread amongst the, the populations of the humpback whales. We started getting it in British Columbia, uh, and now it's one of the most common behaviors that we see um, of them feeding. And actually in Antarctica, uh, we witnessed um, individual bubble net feeding where the whale will sort of circle um, a pot of herring, uh, individually blowing bubbles, and then coming up on its own through them. Whereas in Alaska, we get it amongst 15 to 20 whales. Uh, quite quite spectacular to see. Um, and of course, we get the um, grizzly bears. And this year, um, like we just saw, I just saw it in Harrison Mills, has been a really good, good salmon run, which is extremely good for uh, these guys, because we've had a few really bad years, unfortunately. Um, and I was thinking that with uh, the fire season we had, especially in Adams River, I don't know if um, anyone here is familiar, but Adams River got a really bad um, forest fire um, this year, and it got hit pretty hard. Uh, but luckily, the hatchery and everything um, stayed intact. Um, so hopefully, and they actually had a really good salmon run as well. So hopefully, um with the things that we are doing along the coast in terms of mitigating fishing and things like that, uh, we're getting a few really good salmon years, which is, um, I'm excited to, to see this year, hopefully in September. Um, next time you guys have me on this presentation, it'll be 33 days amongst grizzly bears. <laughs> um, but yeah, going back <clears throat> to the East Coast, uh, where we spend some time photographing uh, the northern gannets um, in Gaspésie uh, along the, or sorry, in Gasp on Perche Rock in the Gaspésie Peninsula. Uh, sort of really, really amazing to see and the different colonies too, because we were just in the Falklands and we were using the same techniques, uh, cameras on monopods with remote triggers to capture albatross um, and. I wish I had those pictures uh, to show you, but um, in Antarctica, we took 73,000 pictures with my dad. Um, and I have seen a total of 10 of them just because we got back on the 15th and then uh, with the holidays and everything, I, I've been really bad with editing, but um, very similar to, to this, the colonies of, of birds are absolutely um, amazing. And then going back, of course, to um, the grizzly bears. Um, along the, the west coast of, of British Columbia, especially in the summer. It's amazing to see um, sort of what I was showing um, in my earlier presentations and what I'll get to shortly, uh, the amazing sort of interactions bears have amongst each other and with people, uh, especially when we uh, leave them alone. And in recent years, especially since the um, banning of trophy hunting, these bears have been um, doing uh, extremely well, which is really beautiful to see sort of the uh, come back and the uh, rebound of all of the all the wildlife, not just in Antarctica, but also in our backyard, um, and all particularly due to the um, salmon run. This is actually one of my favorite pictures, uh, really showing sort of the um, the contrast between the cycle of the salmon, the life and death, both in the leaves and in the salmon. And I've tried to recapture this picture multiple times with uh, better cameras, but this just so happened to be when sort of the stars aligned and we had a really perfect year where um, we didn't get those uh, torrential downpours that we're so used to now in, in October, but it was actually a very calm, calm winter. So all the salmon um, really could run their whole natural cycle um, and get deposited throughout the forest by the eagles and the bears. So they didn't actually get washed out um, into the sea until um, January. So this was in December. Um, when they were still uh, just at the end of their uh, at the end of their life cycle, um, 
of course, the presentation focuses sort of on, on the journey from the north to the south and what better way to do it with um, the auroras. Um, and again, one of uh, personal favorites of mine captured on the on the Dempster Highway along the Arctic Circle. We actually had a shoot um, go there this year uh, to film caribou and the caribou migrate across these mountains, um, across the Dempster Highway into the Arctic Wildlife Refuge in, in Alaska. And it's the porcupine caribou herd. And it's one of the last um, remaining caribou herds that's actually um, not uh, in decline. It's actually increasing, uh, which is quite uh, spectacular to see as most of the caribou herds um, in Canada are um, quite um, drastically decreasing in numbers, um, especially now for a project I'm working on, we're uh, really focusing on caribou. And it's incredible to see sort of uh, the effects that um, mining and logging has had on um, on the caribou, uh, not necessarily the the wolves and things like that, as uh, we are so often led to believe, but uh, mostly the the industrial aspects has really decimated the a lot of the herds. But luckily in the Yukon, uh, it's still still quite pristine. Um, though the highway does have an impact on it, this is the Dempster Highway. Uh, taken with the drone, you can really see sort of um, the difference and the effects of sort of the the climate change on the tundra and the land really cracking underneath the permafrost and everything sort of moving and changing. Um, and it's really interesting, while the Dempster Highway literally cuts right through the migration path of, um, of the caribou herds, uh, the caribou have literally learned when to cross and not to cross. So they'll have specific um times so they'll when they cross the highway and that's usually at night when they know that the hunters um are back um uh, back at home and it's really amazing to see you could almost time your watch on it when you the sun sets and then they give it 30 minutes and then all of the wildlife comes comes right to the highway you have the caribou crossing you have the um, moose um uh, in this lake actually i was camped there and we had a uh, moose visiting every single night uh, and grizzly bears and um, wolves, all of that just come into life as soon as um, all the hunters leave, kind of reminding us um, of uh, the importance um, uh, we play in the environment, and especially when we leave it alone. Um, but yeah, again, sort of this, this same landscape, but uh, more, uh, and I shouldn't say too far further down south, only about an hour down south, but you really see the uh, the difference in the tree line where here you have the vast expanse of the tundra and then here you have the vast expanse of the of the boreal forest and the taiga so it's um really amazing to see and of course here in this area the, the flooded by beaver dam creating uh, a beautiful sort of um pristine landscape for uh, various swan species and swan uh, geese species as they migrate um to sort of uh, delta and the the wetlands around uh, around vancouver <clears throat> and of course we have an area we i'm sure are familiar with which is cypress mountain <laughs> um and a particular favorite i captured uh, this past year in um on cypress mountain um when we still had snow um this year has been really bad on snow so this was captured last season uh, when we had a really good um, good year, but La Nino, or El Nino this year has been um, sort of de decimating the snowpack where I was just up um, in the mountains in the Hemlock Valley. And um, usually there would be heaps of snow and there was um, flowers blooming. Um, so it'll be quite interesting to see the effects um, of this year's season on not just the the water levels but also on the on the forest fires uh, in the coming year which uh, unfortunately I'm um, I'm hoping we get uh, a wet season um, but um, we'll see exactly how uh, how much of an effect um, this lack of snow will have um, on the on the dryness of, of the coming season um, but still in the higher elevations, especially in the higher, there's, in the Yukon especially, uh, this year has had, even with this season, has had quite a big dumping of snow, which is really good. But the Hudson Bay, where I do most of my work on polar bears, has unfortunately not been not been so lucky. So we've, um, we've been 
unfortunately um the polar bears that um uh, we are so used to filming have um are about a month late in terms of sea ice um but uh, i'll get to that just here shortly um this is another picture from patagonia so just before going into antarctica i was able to revisit a very favorite picture, place of mine which is um the uh, patagonia and most importantly um torres del paine and fitzroy in uh, in argentina and in chile one of my favorite areas and amazing success story um of uh, what can be accomplished when sort of people get together and uh, leave nature alone. In this area, actually, um, uh, Patagonia, the company, decided they were going to purchase farmlands. Uh, so they created an amazing buffer zone around this national park. Um, so helping serve another advancing glacier, um, protecting the whole area, and of course, uh, the wildlife that is here, uh, which is the pumas and the guanacos. So protecting sort of the mountains uh, you see here. Uh, has increased the guanaco population because the farmers aren't hunting them, the fences aren't um, catching them, um, and the puma population um, in in Patagonia has absolutely skyrocketed. So um, we witnessed many hunts um, of pumas on guanaco, and I'll save those pictures for next time because um, and videos because it was quite um, quite amazing to see um, the the pumas organizing and again similar if you remember my presentation last time on polar bears sort of creating family groups and really sort of throwing that theory out the window that these are solitary creatures that are only specifically aimed at feeding um but really sort of building family groups and almost like neighbors so they can sense which pumas they know and which ones they like and there's uh, drama amongst the amongst the groups uh, so really amazing amazing to see um, but uh, one of the highlights I guess of this year um, was um, swimming with the humpback whales uh, so what the pictures you saw earlier of them uh, feeding and being on the surface all captured um, in their feeding grounds where the water is quite murky uh, just because of the amounts of nutrients. Um, but to capture them in the water, we went down to the South Pacific, uh, specifically Tahiti, where we got to swim with them and free dive with them. So these are my uh, fins with uh, a mum and calf um, coming up from, from the deep blue. And then, of course, uh, one of the calves um, coming to, to explore my camera. Now, this was quite quite an amazing story and one of those moments that I will just absolutely look back on forever. Um, there was this one calf, very, very new uh, to this world, only about a few weeks old. Uh, might not look like it, but um, literally just a few weeks old. And I was uh, taking a picture um, of it. And every time the calf would come up, uh, it wanted to play with us and interact. They're extremely social animals. Um, and every time it came up and tried to, to play, the mom would sort of come up to the surface from the blue and take it back down with her. Uh, and it happened about two or three times. And then the third time the calf came up and came up from the blue and started coming towards me. And I was with my safety diver and we were together and the calf came up between us and started interacting with me. So it came up between us and then started chasing me away from, from my safety diver. Uh, so I'm trying to take pictures and swim away um, because obviously the calf is unaware of how big its flukes are and how big the body is. Um, and I'm terrified of deep water. So <laughs> um, calf was swimming up towards me and then I just peeked my head out briefly and I could hear my uh, safety diver yelling at me saying, watch out for the mom. And sure enough, the mom came up from the deep blue and as she came up, she touched the bottoms of my fins and started uh, following me with the baby, trying to, um, of course, thinking um, I'm there to endanger its baby. She was trying to chase me away, but at the same time, just trying to run away and the baby's trying to play. So it was quite the hectic situation. Um, and then they both sort of swam by and disappeared into the blue. Absolutely an amazing moment where you sort of look into the eyes of the eyes of the the humpback whale and you can really see um, so much emotion and, and history of um, of these whales. Uh, so personal favorite and absolute um, treasure of a, a moment for, for me this year. 
um, from uh, this amazing area. This is another uh, picture of us paddle boarding. And you can really see how crystal clear that water is uh, and why these whales sort of come there to, uh, to have their calves. Um, and then some moments from uh, the Amazon rainforest and Iguazu Falls um, and the beautiful sort of um, tropical rush rainforests, uh, which um, this year have actually seen um, a decrease of about 25% in deforestation due to the um, new government being in being uh, in place in Brazil and in the surrounding areas. So it's quite amazing to see how these pristine places are uh, once again being being protected. Um, now, sort of back from the South Pacific to one of my favorite places, which is the the Canadian Arctic. Um, now this year I spent six months there, five months there. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of this work is under NDA, so I can't uh, show you the pictures, but I can tell you the stories of uh, how we documented polar bears uh, actually hunting beluga whales in the summer. Uh, now, I know a lot of, there's a few series that have been um, on it, Seven Worlds, BBC, they all did segments of where you see the polar bears jumping on the beluga whales from rocks. Um, but this year, we were really able to document it um, to an extent that hasn't really been seen before. Um, and in 2026, um, a new Arctic series will come out uh, where you will be able to see uh, some stunning behaviors of uh, various bears uh, hunting beluga whales um, in the summertime, which is quite extraordinary because usually uh, the bears would actually be fasting from uh, around May to November, depends on the season, May to December. Um, but actually the bears uh, in the Canadian Arctic around Churchill uh, along the Hudson Bay will actually be at their fattest in September. Um, after having just feasted on beluga whales all summer, they will head into the winter season uh, and they will actually have a lean winter instead of the opposite. So uh, it, it's amazing to see how these uh, animals are uh, adapting and changing. Um, and of course, the, the extreme power of uh, these more terrestrial mammal uh, mammals and the strength they have once uh, once they enter the water um, now these just being a few screen grabs from um, the pictures from my presentation before on the 33 days um, amongst bears uh, and the work we were able to do for um, for geo BBC and National Geographic now some of these videos and new ones um, will come out uh, also in this uh, in this new series in 2026, we were able to again document various bears in the summer, uh, which was quite um, quite beautiful to to see them amongst the amongst the wildflowers, and um, a few personal favorites uh, came back uh, like. Um, uh, Hercules, the three-legged polar bear. So I ended up seeing him again this year um, after having now been alone without its mom for, for about two years. And of course, the the famous picture of um, of this polar bear sleeping, sleeping on safari weed. So it was amazing to be back and once again witness a few um, amazing moments uh, and to kind of really see that uh, the theories we had about the polar bears in this area um, are really sort of coming true where if you see it once, you know, uh, it's more of an estimate. If you see it twice, it's an educated guess. And now they're really starting to to have some proof behind why these bears are visiting this area, what they're doing there and how, how healthy they, they really are. Um, so it's really beautiful to see uh, some personal personal favorites. I wish I saw this bear again. I haven't seen him yet. Maybe this year. <laughs> uh, I'm supposed to go back again in, in August um, to film the bears and hopefully um, see them once again hunting um, hunting the terns um, amongst the amongst other species. Oh. And for some reason, I apologize. One second. I just have to see what is... Uh, Sorry, if you just bear with me for one second. Uh, just trying to see why the presentation ended there. Oops. Let's 
sorry. Okay, we just have a few slides to go here, but for some reason, um, And so I apologize. Right, just bear with me for one second, technical um, problems. <laughs> just have a few slides to go through. Um, there's a um, film we just did um, as a, the one uh, project will come out in 2026. Um, but for those of you who um, have seen um, the new Our Planet on the Move documentary film um, on on Netflix, uh, we were able to film um, full screen. Can I get a thumbs up if we're seeing this? Yeah, we're seeing it. We are? Okay. It's not full size though, so I'm not sure. Okay, let me let me try one more time. Oh, that's good. Yeah. That's good. Okay, perfect. Um yeah, so we were documenting um the various cultures of um Inuit people and the uh, relationship they have. I so I apologize, it's a very gory picture. Um, and the relationship they have with with the walrus, um, and this um, is a is a new segment that's um, that can be seen um, on uh, on Netflix on Our Planet on the Move uh, narrated but by, by David Attenborough. So it's um, an amazing segment we filmed up in northern Canada, sort of illustrating the relationship that the Inuit people have um, with these mammals. And while we, I talked earlier about um, our relationship um, with the natural world and how when we leave it alone, really these animals have been able to rebound uh, in the Canadian Arctic. Uh, a lot of these animals are still hunted. And while we look at it as, um, um, you know, a potentially destructive situation for these mammals, um, it is quite the opposite in the sense that it's really culturally based for these Inuit and it's really part of their um, natural diet and their uh, way of um, sharing um, sharing the Canadian Arctic. So it's a beautiful piece that was done um, that can be seen on Netflix. And a part of that is also the um, the relationship that the Inuit have with, with bowhead whales. And we were actually able to see uh, over a hundred different bowhead whales uh, within a period of about two days. Um, so it was quite amazing to see just the true abundance um, of these whales uh, in the Canadian Arctic. So while a lot of these animals are um, being hunted, uh, there's a very strong population and quite uh, the effects that the hunting has on these animals is actually minimal in, in terms of the effects that shipping has, the climate change has that all these other factors are sort of playing um, into um, sort of the migratory patterns of not just walrus, but other species. So this was um, last year when we uh, were up in sort of the northern Hudson Bay area um, filming the walrus. And then this year um, in May, I managed to go on an expedition that I've been planning for a very long time, and that's to Northern Baffin Island to document sort of the amazing scenery uh, and wildlife that occurs along the flow edge. So this is the sort of the cliffs of, uh, of Baffin Island just before they come to life. Uh, and only about two or three weeks after this picture was taken, this picture will be filled with millions of nesting guillemots, fulmars, uh, seagulls, various other bird species uh, that utilize the, the flow edge um, and the abundance of life that comes to the Arctic. Now, while a lot of the focus was polar bears, uh, one of the biggest uh, dreams come true was uh, the narwhals and beluga whales we were able to document. Uh, so it was quite spectacular to see um, how much life was on the flow edge. I mean, in one day, we managed to see every single Arctic species 
um and that was in one day from polar bears arctic foxes all the way down to belugas narwhals bowhead whales every single um animal made an appearance um on the flow edge now every single day we saw narwhals uh, various pods varying from one individual to four to a few dozen um spending sort of um a various amount of time from june to, to september um, along the flow edge sort of feeding on the on the abundance of life now in recent years um, i would say five years um, there has been increased activity in uh, not just shipping which is sort of really disturbing the pattern of the narwhal uh, but also of killer whales so we're actually getting killer whales now in the high arctic um, feeding on belugas and narwhals which is something that hasn't never really been documented before um an extremely new behavior so it'll be interesting to see um not just how the arctic changes within the next few years in terms of um ice but also in terms of the amount of various other life that shouldn't be there that is um uh, that is appearing i mean they had a salmon shark in arctic bay on baffin island last year various other fish species are popping up along the um along the northwest passage so it's really interesting to see sort of the uh, the change in change in environment that is uh, that is coming to this area, um, but yeah, so that sort of completes the journey from Antarctica to the Arctic, and I will open up um, the chat to um, to any questions that uh, people might might have, if any. Oh, thank you, Martin. That was quite an amazing journey. Yeah, I apologize for the gory picture when I didn't realize the, the screen would pop up right to that when I opened it. So I, I realized maybe what people wanted to see. So I apologize. <laughs> it's part uh, of it was, life. It was not in the original life. plan. <laughs> That's part of life up there. It's still part of life up there. And uh, and it's going to continue, I'm sure. But yeah, that so was probably. quite some amazing photography and, and your little encounter with the uh, humpback whale babies. Just... Um, incredible oh, thank you, you know, thank my, you my, brother is actually, my brother is going to the antarctic on the 17th of january actually and he said i'm not really sure what i'm going to see there <laughs> don't there know why is, i'm going <laughs> there will be a lot he has it, no it's, idea. Been, it's been an incredible year for um orcas like i said and uh, just whale activity in general has been um absolutely spectacular so i'm sure if, uh, it'll be a really, really exciting trip. <laughs> oh, I'm sure it will be. Uh, okay, here's Karen is saying, oops, I'm back here. Oh, I'm back. Question. Okay, just a second, Audrey. Uh, just, Karen was saying thank you so much for sharing your spectacular journey. Okay, Audrey, you had a question? Uh, yes, I do. With the narwhals, what is the purpose of that long, those long tusks? What do they do? Yeah, so there's there's various theories. I think uh, one th really important thing to note about any sort of species in the Arctic is they're extremely understudied. Um, and everything we know about them is quite literally um, a theory, um, except for a few scientifically proven. But for the most part, they use it for um, communication, for hunting as well, um, similar as uh, um, a sailfish would use its um its um, um i apologize english is um <laughs> the word isn't coming to my mouth right now but in the same way they use it to sort of swipe at fish and collect them um, as well as ice so they will use it to break up ice as the winter freezes to make breathing holes for themselves whereas belugas they usually keep a hole open um just by using it all winter uh, narwhals will use the tusks to sort of um, chip away at the ice and also communication amongst each other, fighting. Uh, quite often you see them uh, using the tusks to sort of um, almost fight each other. Um, so it's it's extraordinary to see. And the females will often also have a very small, small tusk as well. Okay, any, any questions? I have a question if I can... Uh, ask it. Uh, first of all, beautiful presentation. I loved it. Uh, but the question I have: Are, are you ever in, feel endangered by the bears when you're there? Because you're awfully close to them. 
Yeah, not uh, not in particular. Like, um, I mean, we have all of the safety precautions in place, um, ranging from a bear guard to bear flares, bear spray, things like that. Um, but often the biggest or the best mitigation is to know the animal and know the the specific bear. So quite often we'll spend a few days uh, getting to know a bear. And then once we know him, then we make the decision, okay, we can work with this animal. We can walk with it. We can take pictures um, because sometimes you get a bear scarred up big male we leave them alone we lock up camp and we sort of try and uh, get as far away from it as possible uh, and then you get the mums and cubs uh, young males uh, females bears like that that are very um, easy to work with and we can really work with them another question if no one else does um, when you go to Alaska you see the glaciers calving. Do you see that in Antarctica as well? I know that huge, huge pieces of mass do break off, yeah. but it's a little different. It's not like the calving. Uh, did you see that? Yeah. So actually I would say in Antarctica, it happens way more often. Um, a lot of the, uh, it ranges from huge bergs, like you saw the um, the first picture of the, the one at sunset to uh, smaller bits like you saw around uh, around the boat um, so it it does happen uh, quite regularly the picture that I had the drone shot uh, within three hours there was about five calvings um, of fairly large pieces um, going into the ocean not necessarily as big as say you would see in Greenland um where you have huge uh, bits uh, falling more in Antarctica they're more tabular bergs uh which break off and just float away in the sense of they break off and roll um uh, and put on a real uh, spectacular scene depends on the on the glacier ice field depends on the ice pack things like that so uh, but for the most part quite a lot of it is um the ice shelves break off into tubular bergs which is what you see in that huge berg that broke off in 83 that's still uh, floating now just making its way past the peninsula uh, along the eastern side of the peninsula you get quite a lot of the the same bergs you would see in in greenland in alaska places like that i have another question by may mm -hmm. um uh, with the bears, are, are the, the polar bears, are their diets changing to more towards a whale than to seals? Yeah, so they're, um, it's hard to say, but they are adapting. Like for the most part, they, they were all, they always hunted whales um, opportunistically. Um, in the high Arctic, you actually get them jumping off of the flow edge sometimes on the belugas, on the narwhals, so opportunistically hunting them. But what we're seeing more now in the Hudson Bay is organized hunting. So they specifically know these areas are uh, delivering food. So they're and specific rocks that they are using to hunt uh, whales. Um, so they're actually really going to specific areas where they know that they can now feed in the summer. So their diet in those areas is changing. I know in Svalbard, some of my friends are documented polar bears feeding on reindeer, uh, caribou, uh, there are parts of Canada where uh, polar bears are eating uh, char, Arctic char, in the river estuaries, um, feeding on various um, other species. So, again, opportunistically hunting various other um, mammals and marine life. Mm. Uh, but uh, in certain areas, they're very much getting used to, you know, the idea that these bears are not feeding in the summertime um, is... A debatable one because if the bear does see prey uh and it is in the mood to hunt it it will it will hunt yeah because they, they were concerned that the polar bear might be threatened by the lack of of the while well, the ice breaking up and so they couldn't get seals so it sounds and 100 like percent it has it has a huge impact on them like um especially towards later in the season like this year in Churchill, ice usually forms at the start of November. Um, I had reports in December that there was still no ice. 
um, that will have devastating effects, even on the bears that feed on the belugas. Um, it's just the whole natural world is, is sort of being thrown out of whack. Uh, so these animals are used to patterns and migrations. So um, it will be interesting to see what effects that the changing of the ice will have, not just on the bears, but also on the migratory belugas uh, that now all of a sudden these bears are relying on uh, even in the summertime. So the whole thing is sort of just um, losing that natural balance, but they are adapting, which is um, quite the um, important part. Not all of them, but, you know, um, with time, they will they will adapt to uh, new hunting and, and new conditions. Hey, Anisha has a comment here. She's saying that she has no audio on her computer, but she had, you had indicated um, or suggested that pumas are hunting cooperatively, which puts mm -hmm. a new slant on their behavior. Any further comments on that? Yeah, I mean, there is, um, and I, I've i only observed them for, for a period of time. There is um, various experts I know that have sort of been living with them for extensive amounts of time, months and years. Uh, where they've seen various behaviors of um, puma groups um, not necessarily cooperating, but um, as we see sort of in Africa, but also really sort of not being as um, territorial as we may be thought. Uh, even now, when we were down there, there was um, what we thought was an adult, but it was actually one of the older cubs. Uh, and for four days in a row, every single day, it hunted a guanaco, uh, a baby guanaco. And on the last day, um, we weren't there, but a friend of mine stayed and he saw the, the puma chase after a guanaco and a different puma came and started fighting it. Um, and then they both ended up feeding on the guanaco and then a third puma showed up and um, and start, and joined the, the feast. So it's... Again, it depends on on the animal, and same as in the Canadian Arctic, you have moments when all the animals are cooperating and feeding together when food is abundant, uh, and you have moments when food is scarce when uh, when there's a real competition for uh, the food. When we were there in, in Patagonia, now was um, when the guanaco had their babies, so there was an extreme abundance of um, of food. So uh, the pumas weren't necessarily territorial. Uh, amongst each other but you'll see groups especially family groups so mom with um, cubs not necessarily fresh cubs hunting together uh, potentially sticking together the cub siblings um, into adulthood to um, to hunt together as well are there any questions from people in the church oh sid do you i'm sorry you uh, a non-wildlife question uh, about the drake passage it's it's famous or infamous for for the uh, violent weather and sea conditions that you can experience there off the Cape of Good Horn. What was your experience, Martin? I've experienced it four times now. And whether you, we want to say unfortunately or fortunately, every single time it, it's been known as the Drake Lake. <laughs> oh. um, so it's been extremely calm. I still get motion sickness. So I still put a patch on, but um, the last few times i've done it it's it's been fairly calm um uh, so it depends when you hit it um expedition ship companies uh especially the really good ones know to leave antarctica earlier or later uh and to travel faster or slower to really get into areas when it's it's not so it's not so rough um i know the expedition after us had a really rough crossing so it's it's kind of the luck of the draw um but um i have not experienced a, a really awful time just yet <laughs> so you suffer from motion sickness and you're afraid of deep water yeah <laughs> but when the picture is okay. worth it I'll, I'll i'll risk my life and i'll, I'll do it that's so. quite incredible martin <laughs> what you do <laughs> considering these uh these things that might be drawbacks for some people <laughs> Yeah, no, I um I try and turn them into advantages. At least with the humpbacks, it was um it, it was a way to get over that fear to to be in the water with those those amazing uh, amazing creatures. Yeah. So, are there any questions from the church hall? Is the church hall still with us? Is the church hall still with us? Do, are there still people there? Yeah, it's, it's pretty quiet here, though. 
pretty quiet there. Okay. And maybe we'll let Martin go. And he can prepare himself for his eye surgery tomorrow. <laughs> no worries. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank, thank you so much. That was that was incredible. It was uh, it was my pleasure, and hopefully um, next time I'll be able to share with you videos and and pictures from from the polar bears hunting and and other stories. So it was thanks okay, for having wonderful. me. We'll look forward to that. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Okay. Take care. Happy New Year. And same to you. Okay. So for next meeting.